Okay, great. And so, Rachel, if you would just give us some of your background, where you come from, um, how long you've been with UCC, et cetera. You know, you did a, I was at the AAUW meeting when you were speaking there, and it was very interesting. So yeah. We're quite glad to have you tonight. So, yes, thank you so much for inviting me. It's lovely to, to see you all. Um, so a bit about me. So I have been here for a year and a half now. Um, and uh, let me see. I was I was drawn. Let's start with why I, I am here at UCC first. Um, so I was a vice president at a college in Colorado, Colorado Mountain College. And I love my job. Um, super happy, loved my job, loved where I worked and wasn't really seeking to be a president of a college necessarily. Um, but somebody sent me the uh, job posting for the president's position here at UCC. And um, the note the person put on it was, it's like they wrote this for you. Um, and it and that was certainly true. Uh, the way that our board wrote the job posting um, really spoke to me. Uh, it it talked. It was kind of irreverent and kind of funny, um, but felt like it had serious heart to do with the community um, and the the connection between the community and the college. And um, Oregon was one of the five states that my husband and I said we would ever live in. So can anybody guess what the five states are? <laughs> so Colorado, right? We lived in Colorado. Um, so they have to be states with mountains. So Wyoming, Montana, Oregon, Washington. And that's because we like to ski. Mm -hmm. So um, so it felt like this perfect match from the very beginning. And I put my application in and and to be honest, didn't necessarily think I'd ever hear anything. And then I ended up making it all the way to the to the final three candidates. There were 87 applications, apparently, for the position. And um, the day before my interview, uh, I came onto campus to make sure I knew where I was going, like you do when you're a good interviewee. And um, we walked all around campus. And if any of you have been on the trail that goes all the way down to the river in the back of our campus, um, we got to the river and I, I got a little bit teary and uh, my husband turned to me and he said, oh, you really want this, don't you? <laughs> and I said, yes, it's so beautiful and amazing. And um, I mean, I was I was already super in, but but once we came to visit the community, which really just fits us because we're outdoorsy people and we like small communities, we could never imagine ourselves in a city anywhere. And um and the, felt the warmth of the people that we met while we were here. Um, it uh, it just turned out to be a perfect fit. So um, I always like to tell that story because I think people always want to know, like, how did you end up in Roseburg, Oregon? Um, so we are totally in love with our community. And and um, a, just a, a brief uh, sort of synopsis about me. I grew up in the UK. Um, I was there all the way through undergrad university. Um, and no, my parents weren't in the military. That's my parents are actually Welsh. And I grew up in Nottingham, England and went to Manchester University. And um, but I have been in the States now for 33 years. I went to Colorado for a ski season to be a ski bum right after I finished my degree. And uh, I was only supposed to be here for six months and it's been 33 years. Um, so I am all in. I'm still a British citizen, but also a US citizen as well. And I started my career in K-12. I was a high school teacher. Um, and then I actually went to work for um, an organization that did trainings for uh, corporations. So I worked mostly for pharmaceutical uh, companies around the world. I was very fortunate. They jetted me off to all kinds of exotic places. Um, to work and uh, worked with university professors and K-12 teachers. And um, and about 11 years ago, I popped back into higher ed as a dean and um, the rest is history. Here I am. Does that do it, Robin? Yes, we're so glad you're here. Thank you. Me too. You, Rachel. Me too. Yeah, very interesting. And, so and would, you like, would you like me to? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just saying you're a regular Northwest person 
and and we're excited you're here. Yeah. So would this be a good time for me to put up my PowerPoint and go sure. from there? Yes. Okay. Give me a second here while I do the uh, the honors. Okay, you're all seeing my screen there with our fantastic nursing students. Right. You can see it nicely. Great. <laughs> Great. So, um, yeah, so thank you for inviting me to uh, talk about UCC. Um, and please make this informal. If there are questions, just jump right in and ask them. Um, and I, I love a conversation. So whatever questions you might have. And I have no idea what kind of background you have about knowing about UCC. So also please tell me things because I am still learning about our amazing college here. So um, we are currently engaged in figuring out what UCC 2.0 should be. Um, the pandemic was a real reset for higher education um, really across the world. What are we doing? Are we teaching in the right way? What are the right skills that we should be bringing to our students? So it's this beautiful place in time um, to reevaluate everything we do in higher education and make sure that it's serving our communities, in the case of community colleges, and then our students um, and what they need to learn to set them up for a bright future. Um, just to sort of give you a um, an idea of what I think I walked into and and um, you as community members would even know better. Um, there were there have been four presidents of UCC uh, since 2015. And um, that has had an impact. And of course, also in 2015, we experienced um, a tragic uh, shooting event here on campus for which there is still a considerable amount of trauma. I would say I feel that trauma in folks here and, and in the wider community uh, almost daily in my work. And um, many people have turned that into extremely positive outcomes, but I think the institution has, um, has suffered for a number of years because of that setback. And then um, a lot of turnover in leadership, which is often difficult for people. So we've been focusing as we come out of the pandemic on sort of saying under new management, let's start a new day. Let's start fresh. This is a really great opportunity for us to just refresh our thinking and everything that we're doing. Um, I would also say during that time, really since 2014, the college has not initiated any new programs. And so we're a little bit behind in the state in order in uh, in order to catch up to the workforce and what workforce needs are and what our local industry needs in employees. So we're a little bit lagging, but to me, that's the most beautiful opportunity to uh, catch up and then forge ahead and become the best community college uh, on the West Coast. That is certainly our goal. So we have the opportunity this year to refresh our strategic plan. So in the next couple of months, I'll be rolling out a new strategic plan um, that will really set us up for the next three to four years and everything that we're going to do, new programs and things like that. So some of the things that I'll talk about tonight are things that are up and coming uh, in that plan. But really our goal is to be modern, to be innovative, to be community serving. Um, I always say that community is in our name. So if we're not thinking about the community with every decision that we make, um, every service that we offer, then we're failing. So let's make sure that that word community is in everything we do. And then really my focus this last year and a half has been on listening. Um, I have made a big effort to both listen to all of our stakeholders on campus and then as many of our stakeholders as I possibly can out in the community. And it has been eye-opening and interesting. And um, I think the biggest takeaway for me is that there are almost no people in Douglas County that haven't had some sort of touch point with this institution. Many, many, many of them started their academic career here. Many of them have taken uh, community education classes with us. 
almost every child learned to swim in our pool. <laughs> People walk their dogs. Um, just the connections to this institution are um, so strong. And there is such overwhelming community support for us and um, sort of the community pulling for us to be the very best as well. So so really, there's just this beautiful environment for us to be uh, ridiculously successful. So I am going to start with some point of pride, exciting news, because I know everybody always wants to know about enrollment. And these are numbers that have come out in the last month. Um, so after a number of years of declining enrollment to do with the pandemic, but also to that that's a national trend in higher education and certainly in community colleges, um, we are uh, bouncing back. So for the fall um, 2022, we were up 15% in our headcount. So the number of actual people uh, coming in and uh, taking classes at the college. And that relates to 3% in our full-time equivalents. So the equivalent um, of a full-time student can be made up of many part-time students. I hope that makes sense. Sometimes we, we speak in these acronyms in higher ed. Um, what that tells us is we've got a lot more students taking fewer classes. So more and more part-time students which is something we constantly have to think about. Who are our students and are we serving them in the way that they need based on their life situation, et cetera. Um, and then in winter, uh, we had 3% increase in headcount. So 3% more individual humans um, and 13% FTE. So our students started to take more classes, right? Um, which means I think that they're settling back into their post-pandemic lives um, and they feel more confident that we're going to stay open, that we're not going to slide back into um, being closed like we were in the pandemic. Our Most of our students really enjoy face-to-face uh, -face interactions, even if that's not every class, even if it's um, they come to class once a week and some of their coursework is online. Uh, they missed us, which is which is nice and we like being here for them. Uh, we are still down over post pandemic numbers. So that's an important thing to remember is that this is all good news. And also we need to push hard because um, we need to continue on that upward trajectory. And I will say that um, sometimes people think that the reason that we get excited about enrollment is because of funding because it means money, because it means tuition money. And that is not the reason. The reason is because every one of these numbers reflects somebody's life. It is a life transformed. It is a life for somebody that can now make a family supporting wage. Um, somebody in our community that will need less public assistance because they have bettered themselves by coming to school. And um, that's the reason why enrollment matters. I always like to remind people of that. I um, thought I'd share a few other statistics because again, I'm not sure what you all know about the college, but we on average in a year have about 8,500 total students. About 2,500 of those are degree or certificate seeking. So there's a large majority there that are maybe they're taking, um, let me see, maybe they're taking a choir class or a watercolor class or maybe they're coming one day for a CPR class, or maybe they are in a truck driving four week program. So a smaller number of sort of traditional degree and certificate seeking students, and then a lot of folks interacting with us on more of um, a temporary basis, let's say. About a third of our students go on to university. So they're getting a transfer degree or transfer credits of some sort. Um, and a majority of our students are part-time students, about 67% are part-time. So what that tells us too is most of our students are working, right? So uh, sometimes when I'm out in the community, we'll have these conversations and people will say, well, you know, what do the students think? And I always say, well, ask your employees because they're probably our students. Um, most of our students have at least one job, if not a few. And uh, a lot of them have kids. Um, you know, the, the 
the biggest percentage of students we have are age 30 to 39, and they're right around 25% of our enrollment. So lots of people upskilling, lots of people who maybe didn't make it to college right out of high school saying, you know what, I think I want to go back or I, I think I want to become a nurse, whatever, whatever they might choose. And we have right around on any given day about 400 employees here at the college. So we're also one of the major employers uh, in the community. That was a lot of information already. Does anybody have any questions about any of that? Well, no, but I can say that I graduated from Umqua Community College back in 1995. Went for five years when my kids were in school and I got top grad of the year and um, a program, a football programming degree. So, which I'm very proud of and always oh. will be, just FYI. <laughs> that is fantastic. Thank you for sharing that, Robin. All right, so I thought I'd share a few of our wins from this past year. Um, if you did not know, our Woolley Center, which is where we teach our GED classes, has the highest passing rate of any GED program in the state. So that's not just the GED programs at uh, community colleges. Those are the ones that are embedded in high schools, the independent ones. Um, we are very, very proud of the work that we do at the Woolley Center um, with GED. And we have students in that program who are 16 all the way through to 66. Um, so it's amazing at what stage of life sometimes people decide to go back and take that step. And you know, when those um, when those folks walk across the stage at graduation, I always say that that, that is a bigger accomplishment than somebody getting a doctoral degree. Um, the courage to go and decide to finish that stage of your education, which for many of those folks, they've not had a great experience with education in any way, shape or form their entire lives. Um, so making it through those really, really hard GED tests is um, a massive accomplishment. So we're very proud of them. Um, if you know anything about our campus, you will know that our cafeteria closed about four and a half years ago. We actually opened it today hoping you saw um, the great article that uh, ran in the news review. We found a great partner in the Friendly Kitchen and um, I had lunch there today. I had uh, sweet and sour chicken and it was delicious and it's open to the public. So please come join us any day. Um, put that on your list of places to go to lunch um, and come hang out with our students. We have a new tuition structure that uh, our board voted in last year, and it's a three-year tuition structure. And what I love about it is that it freezes tuition every year. So for example, if you are a student who came in as a new student in the fall of 2022, your tuition is frozen for three years. So uh, <laughs> you would pay $109 per credit hour for the entire three years. We're, we're giving three years, thinking that some folks need a little extra time on a traditional two-year degree. Um, what we love about this is that in the past, uh, higher education has been able to jack the price of tuition whenever we so chose. And we think that's a really bad example for our students. We want them to be able to plan how much their education is going to cost <laughs> um, and be good stewards of their own finances. How could they do that if they have no idea how much they're going to pay next year? So we're really excited about that. Um, please spread the word because I think it's a, it makes people feel trusting and more confidence in what we're doing and, and, uh, and signing up and coming here and being with us. We do have the Southern Oregon Wine Institute reopened. Um, again, it's, it was closed for COVID and uh, the program was closed uh, probably a year before that, I believe. But we're reopened. Um, we have sort of pop-up tasting room events. So look out for those. Mostly we post them on social media. Um, and we do have classes running again um, with internships happening at our local wineries. We only have about seven students right now, but this is kind of the first year the academic program reopened. So we're hoping to build upon that um, in the coming years. 
We brought a bachelor's degree to the UCC campus, and some of you who've lived here for a while might remember that we used to have them, apparently, a number of years ago, I've heard from people. We, we're starting with a psychology degree. We're partnering with Bushnell University. Um, we sort of put out an all call to our university partners and said who would like to offer something here. Um, we love this offering because what I've heard in the community is that we have a real uh, need for mental health care workers, and this is a pathway to being a licensed social worker um, and serving our mental health needs here. So uh, that first cohort started uh, this past fall term, and uh, we had 16 students enrolled in those courses. They're all offered in the evening, so they're really tailored toward uh, people who have jobs during the day and probably work in the mental health field already. Uh, we did secure an $8 million matching grant um, from the state for uh, a new medical training facility here on campus. We have to raise $8 million. So uh, we have some work ahead of us uh, for sure, but we're hoping to add on uh, lab, uh, laboratory spaces for new medical programs that we're planning to offer. And I'll talk about those a little bit here um, when we, uh, a little bit further in my presentation about which medical careers offerings we're, we're going to work on. And then the last one I have here is that we, we really um, decided on a new future for our October 1st day of remembrance to remember the shooting event that happened here. Um, when I got here, uh, I got onto campus in July and we had our memorial service in October. And um, it, it was a very somber event as it should be in many respects. Um, but it, it, it really uh, felt like it needed a new direction. It felt like it needed a new energy and focus. Um, there's, there's a certain period of mourning for want of a better word. Um, and then it is, you go into a new phase. And we felt like our students weren't as connected to what had happened as, as they probably should be because the history of the institution is important for them to know. So we refocused it on a day of giving and service. And we had over 250 students and employees and community members out serving the community. So we had about 11 service projects that they could sign up for. And uh, we turned it into a day of service. And then we had um, a barbecue lunch and we stood, still had a moment of science, silence and uh, an appropriate moment to remember those that were lost and impacted on that day. But um, it was a very uplifting day. Um, and so we are going to adopt that as a regular thing where we will, uh, UCC will serve its community. And really a lot of that is about thanking the community for how it wrapped its arms around the institution um, during that time in 2015. So those are the a few of the things that have gone on in the last year. Um, and then this is probably the one I am most proud of. We launched a program called Friday Career Academy this past uh, year. And um, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about where this first came from. So I promised the board that uh, when I first got on site that I would go and visit every single school district in Douglas County. Um, and I have to say it was the most fun. We have uh, such wonderful K-12 educators doing amazing work in our community. Um, and I am a giant fan of teeny tiny little school districts that just are like the little engines that could. They do such an amazing job of um, little Days Creek. If you've ever been to their uh, school district, it's just, it's wonderful. It's one building and um, they do incredible work for students. So I had this amazing opportunity to sort of go out and say, What's going on in your school district? What do your students need? What are they looking to do when they graduate from you? How can we partner more, share resources, and really um, make a strong illuminated pathway for our Douglas County youth to get post-secondary education and training? And it dawned on me about halfway through that we have a large number of our school districts that do not have school on Fridays. It's mostly the smaller outlying districts um, that only have a four-day school week. 
So it seemed like there was this great opportunity, like what are what are those young people doing on Fridays? Um, how might we interact with them more? And then the other thing I learned is that many of these smaller school districts can't offer the types of programs that many of those students want to do because they're too small, they don't have enough funding, they don't have facilities, they don't have teachers, those kinds of things. Um, so I put out a survey to everyone and I said, what can we offer on campus that we can bring your students in for that you don't currently have at your location? Um, so from all those conversations, we came up with this idea of Friday Career Academy. Uh, we um, applied for state uh, funding for educational innovation and were awarded monies uh, through that program. And then the Ford Family Foundation also came to the table and funded us. And we have uh, just over 40 students on campus every Friday. We bust them in. Um, from the outlying school districts. We serve them lunch and uh, all their textbooks are free and their tuition is free. And they, they are in programs in automotive, in emergency medical technician and in theater currently. Um, it has been wonderful. It's been wonderful to have them on campus. Um, it's been wonderful to meet those young people who, uh, you know, prior to this, they had every Friday off to do whatever they wanted to. And instead of doing that, they signed up for more school. So uh, if anybody ever says to you, um, you know, the youth these days, they're just they're just lazy and they've got no direction. You just get in their face and tell them that is not the case, because I can show you uh, our young people and how much they have taken uh, grasped this opportunity um, to get ahead of their college career. So they're all learning college credits. Um, we have eight school districts participating and next year we're adding forestry, advanced manufacturing and a basic healthcare certificate. So we'll have six different programs um, for them to choose from. And this is a picture of some of our students there working in the automotive shop. So a couple of things for the future that we are starting to work on. Um, we need to do some innovation in our academic program, and that is going to be all about um, looking for new program offerings that really match some of the need that we have in the community. So um, the first uh, sort of suite of programs that we're looking at is in the medical field. So I know all of us are probably um, not as young as we used to be and need more health care. Um, than we did previously. And so you, you probably just like me have waited uh, months for doctor's appointments and uh, they're understaffed and all of those issues. Uh, um, our hospitals are really uh, having a difficult time with, with all of the medical professionals. And we have a great RN program here, 64 students a year. Um, but we have about 150 applications for our nursing program. And we take the cream of the crop as we should for our nurses. But if you are turned down for entrance into UCC nursing school, there's no alternative uh, program for you to go into. We have a few sort of auxiliary things. We have a dental assisting program, for example, but wouldn't it be great for those um, young people who are, are, who are really interested in the medical field, for them, them to have somewhere else to go, a different program for them to sign up for if they don't get into the RN program. So we will launch in the next three years, a respiratory therapy assistant program, a radiology technician program, a surgery technician program. And then we're actually going to go back to offering an LPN as well. Um, LPNs went away about six or seven years ago, but the hospitals now are telling us that they actually would really like to have a bigger LPN uh, uh, field for them to hire from. So lots of new medical programs starting in the next few years. And then the other big place we're going to invest in is advanced manufacturing programs. So um, the best way to describe this is... Uh, Let's say if you've been in one of the mill operations lately, 
This isn't the folks who have the big muscles that make sure all the logs go through the mill. These are the folks who program the machines, they fix the machines, uh, they're highly skilled in computer science um, and robotics. Those kinds of skills, those are the sort of $30, $35 an hour jobs that um, really help our community members get into jobs that have a family supporting wage. So those are the two program areas academically that we're really focusing in on. We are also focusing in on increasing our housing opportunities for students. Um, we have a lot of, of students who experience insecurity in their housing. That makes it really, really difficult to go to school and focus on school if you're worried about where you're gonna live um, and that you have somewhere stable and healthy and clean. Um, and we also have some academic programs that that have a real niche and we won't necessarily be able to make sure those academic programs thrive unless we have somewhere for students to come in from the outside. Really good example is the wine uh, programming. For um, We need housing so that those students can come here from all up and down the Pacific Northwest to come to our program. We have a very unique facility that other colleges don't have a unique industry that they can have work experience in. Another great example is our arts and performing arts. Um, there are not community colleges that have facilities like we have. Um, Jacoby Auditorium is um, is a venue that that is unparalleled in the community college sort of landscape. Um, so we'd really like to to capitalize on that, we'd really like to grow our theater and music and performing arts programs. There probably will never be enough uh, young people in Douglas County to populate that program completely. If we have housing, we can have students come in from all over the place to uh, benefit from those programs here. So it's a great way to support academics. And then we also have thriving athletic programs too that benefit from that housing so students can come in from elsewhere. When you think about housing, do not think the housing you went to when you went to college. We will not be building dorms on campus. Um, and I'll have to come back and tell you about what our actual plan is because I can't really share quite yet. Um, but it's uh, we hope to make some investments in the community that, um, that help lift the community up as well as uh, support our students. And then the last one um, is igniting enrollment and completion of males. So um, this one might sound strange and weird to you, uh, but it's actually really a national issue right now. And we see it quite acutely at UCC. So when I first came on board um, and really when I was interviewing, you know, but part of that process is to dig into all the data about the institution who's graduating, who's being successful, who's not being successful, um, what do we need to work on? And one of the data points that was quite shocking was how poorly our males in Douglas County are doing in post-secondary education, both in terms of um, enrolling and coming to the, to the college. Um, and then once they're here, who is actually completing their program and there is a huge disparity between our females and our males. And um, anybody who's particularly interested in this subject, you can Google it. It's actually a, a real nationwide issue right now. Our young men are dropping out of, of uh, post-secondary opportunities at, at an alarming rate. Um, in my mind, that's a, that's a, a social problem, a potential social problem um, for us. That means a lot of folks who uh, can't support their families, support their children, and be contributing members of our community. So we're we're really going to put in some uh, some resources and some efforts to to balancing that out. Um, that does not mean that we're still we're still working on increasing the numbers of young women in STEM, increasing the number of young women in our welding program and our automotive programs. And we can do both of those things at the same time. So I don't want you to think that um, the pendulum has swung so far the other way. Sherry, yes, question. I'm just curious what the, um, I know I'm sure it's a, 
a very deep story about why that is the case. But if do you have a few bullet points as to why um, the males are have limited enrolling and then more dropout than females? Yeah, um, there are a lot of theories out there. Um, I'm going to start with the one that I think um, is higher education's fault. So it's our fault. Um, over the years, we have defunded many of the programs that were traditionally programs that young men were drawn to um, because they're very expensive. It is a lot cheaper to offer a history class and a psychology class than it is to offer a welding class or an automotive class and um, any of the technical trades, really, construction trades, those kinds of things. So um, I think some of it is that uh, young men don't necessarily see the programs um, in the career path that, that they're interested in. So that's one of the reasons. I think another one of the reasons is that nationally, um, we have, uh, we're sending messages to our young men um, that investing in your education is not a good way to spend your money. Um, so the, the the national conversation about student debt, I think, is is making students think that education is not a good investment. Um, and this idea of, you know, not everybody needs to go to college. Um, I am in rooms all the time. Um, and I will say that oftentimes it's rooms full of people who have degrees saying not everybody needs to go to college. And um, and I know what they mean or I believe I know what they mean. What they mean is not everybody needs to spend four years in an English or a history class, right? But at UCC, if you want to be an electrician, you have to come here to us in Douglas County. If you want to work on HVAC, you have to come to UCC and get trained. If you want to be a welder, you have to come to UCC. If you want to be a police officer, you have to come to UCC. So this idea of um, you don't have to go to college is uh, is inaccurate. And I think just that messaging um, is is not not helping our young people. I think we all have to get behind. Um, you all need to go to college and college can be many different things, right? You can become a truck driver in four weeks, but you do have to come to UCC to do that. Um, so come to college and be a truck driver. Uh, so I think the national message is hurting. Um, and uh, I also think that some of the ways that there's a lot of research out there about the ways that we teach um, our, our young women tend to be more successful in, in sort of the traditional classroom environment. Um, and I will certainly say at UCC that uh, we have some work to do in terms of making our campus feel like um, it's accessible to all. We have a lot of clubs um, here for students, but they're very female focused. They're, um, uh, there, there are a lot of this uh, soft um, social sciences focused, if that makes sense. Oh. Like we have a Spanish club and we have a psychology club and we have a club that does, um, you know, works on food insecurity issues and those kinds of things. What we don't have is a fishing club. And what we don't have is an outdoor adventure club. And we don't have a soup your car up club, right? Things that just you know, you're in our community, you see some of our young males, we need to reflect reflect who they are, meet them where they are, um, make them feel like there are things here for them. Um, I think the day that I said this is, this has to be one of our top things we work on at UCC was graduation. This is a picture of graduation last year. And of course I have the great privilege of standing in front of all the graduates, right? And giving my speech. And I looked out and it was predominantly young women. And when I pulled the data the next day, uh, we graduated 464 students with degrees and certificates and only 161 of them were male. That's the problem. We've I got a problem. A um, and I, uh, I'm excited to, to work on it and see if we can turn that around a little bit. 
And I think somebody just said a question, but I'm not seeing yeah. all the little celebrity squares. So Stacy, oh, I, I have a question. Yeah, Stacy. Yeah, I have I a have question. A I guess I guess I have um some curiosity about why we are um maintaining traditional roles around um uh, the enrollment and completion of males that you're talking about, um, fishing and things that, um, you know, I, I, I'm not really clear about why we're pigeonholing them into certain areas and why we're not looking at the, um, the rise of women and females as being more of a positive instead of trying to, um, uh, go back and fix what's always been dominant. Yes. Can you tell me more about that because I would love to. Skewed. I would love to. Um, so, uh, Stacy, when I first heard about this issue and I started to research it on a national level, um, I almost came unglued. I was like, you have to be kidding me. I have struggled my entire career um, to get ahead, right? And break through the glass ceiling. And you have to be kidding me that now I have to worry about the men. Um, so I totally understand your reaction and, and it really took me digging in and reading some of the research to, uh, to turn that around a little bit. Um, and I'll tell you why for me it turned around. Um, so again, just because we are going to work on this issue doesn't mean we're not still going to make sure that our young women have all of the opportunities that they need an even greater opportunities in the future. Um, the second thing is that uh, we as a community are losing our young men. Um, the Ford Family Foundation has a lot of research into how many of our young men are opting out of the economy, opting out of uh, society. Um, and that means a lot of disaffected. Can you, can you give me some examples of what opting out looks like and what it yes. means? Yes. Yes. So I'm not sure if I'm going to get any of the stats right on this. So forgive me if I don't. But um, but the Ford Family Foundation has research into how many of our males aged 18 to 32 have never received a W-2 in their life. And it it's a, it's a pretty large number. It's between 20 and 30 percent of our young males. Um, in Douglas County have never received a W-2. And that was alarming to me when I really thought about it, right? So yeah, there's probably some people who work on a farm or somewhere where they're involved in a family business, maybe they're not necessarily getting paid. Um, but that is a lot, those are a lot of folks who are not participating our, in our democracy, participating um, in a workplace where they meet other people and they serve their community in some way, they're not engaged. Um, I think we're seeing some of um, what's going on there play out in our national conversation. Um, and it worries me. It, it worries me. Um, I think it's, I think it's alarming. I think it's alarming when we think about family structures and the ability for people to support themselves. Um, yeah, those are those are my reasons, and I could, I I am not an expert, but um, but but if if you're gonna do one thing on this issue, there is a wonderful book. It's called Of Boys and Men by Richard Reeves, um, and it's an easy read. It's not some giant textbook, I promise. Um, it's it's a really fascinating read about what is going on nationally and a little bit internationally with uh, with males. It's a tough one, I know, and it's. It's one of those things where I'm going to come and talk to uh, all of you who are here to support women's issues and tell you that this is what we're going to work on. Um, we're, we are committed to this as an institution, and, and we have the data to show that it's an issue. If we believe in equity, it's got to be equity between the genders, not just racial equity or any of those things. So, Yes. Well, I have a son and a daughter, a son going off to college next year, so I fully embrace both. <laughs> we have to find the balance. <laughs> yeah. And back to your original question. Um, you know, I, I hear you on the like, you know, why am I saying that if we have a if we have a fishing club that it'll be better for men? Yes, it sounds really sexist, doesn't it? I totally agree. 
And also we have to meet our people where they are. I think we have to be very honest about um, who we're serving here. Um, you know, I am with our students all day, every day. And I, uh, when, when you tell them that we're going to have a football watching tailgate party and a fishing club, their eyes light up and they look like they might feel like they're somewhere where they belong. And um, we have a duty to uh, make sure all our students belong. And that doesn't mean that if you're a young man, you can't also join the knitting club. It sounds awesome, but there should be those, there should be opportunities all over the place for a student to feel engaged, no matter who they are or what their interests are. I, I can tell you're not a convert, but I wasn't either. It took me years. So I, I'm totally with you, I promise. Well, I think that, you know, I'm not, I'm not against it, certainly. Um, but I do think that, you know, we have, we have to do some work in um, the, the stigmas that are attached to things that use the term soft skills. And frankly, I believe that's something that we need to instill in, in our young boys and men and finding them role models that, that, um, you know, they're, there's nothing wrong with yoga and meditation. And I use those as extreme examples, potentially for people in this area. But um, I know that it's um, it's a little alarming to me that we're focusing um, on, uh, you know, one aspect of this for them in, in education, when it's more than just an educational um, aspect. I totally understand. I, I completely agree with you. I think we can do both. I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think we can do both things. All right, uh, moving on. Um, so back to the women. These are our women wrestlers. I'm gonna talk a little bit about athletics and what we have going on in uh, athletics at UCC. So uh, this, this program has grown over the last five years. Most of you probably know more about that than I do, but we currently have nine athletic teams at UCC and our most successful uh, athletic program is women's wrestling, um, which I had never come across uh, before coming to UCC. And if you've ever been to a women's wrestling match, it's actually a little bit alarming, um, but they are incredible, uh, incredible athletes. Uh, we have 31 women wrestlers and uh, we are currently ranked number two for junior college women's wrestling across the country. Um, and it's it's one of the fastest growing uh, college sports out there. We have a Spanish national champion on our team. If you can believe that, a young woman from Spain, she's amazing. And we have 32 all Americans and six past national champions. Um, so if, you, uh, if you're brave enough, come up and see our lady wrestlers, um, they are, they're truly incredible. Um, what I love about our athletics program is that our students, our, our athletes are, are, are students first. Um, they, they're, the teams are most often our highest GPA earners um, at the entire institution. And they also bring a lot of diversity that we don't see here in Douglas County. Um, we have, um, we bring students in from really all over the country, and uh, it really gives our local students a wider experience of the world and the country in general to be in class with some of these young people. Um, and then in the coming years, we, we probably will expand maybe a few new programs. One of the things that we're thinking about is actually clay pigeon shooting. Um, and that's because it's again one of the fastest growing sports in high schools uh, particularly in the pacific northwest um, so we're thinking about that and we're also thinking about softball we have a men's baseball team but um, we would like to add women's softball to that roster um, athletics is also something that's a little bit controversial i find when i'm out talking in the community and i did not come from an institution with athletics so um, I'm learning a lot about athletics at the community college level, and um, and I really appreciate the value that it that it adds uh, to our community. 
Um, our athletes are out volunteering all the time. Hopefully you've had some interactions with them, maybe at events, but they, they're out at the Veterans Day Parade and they're, um, they help uh, the Boys and Girls Club. Um, they're constantly volunteering over there. It's baked into their program that they have to volunteer in order to be an athlete and to receive their, um, their scholarship monies. So they do a fantastic job. A little bit more about how we, I think, we're the volunteering as student body in the state. Um, our students volunteer over 10,000 hours in the community. This is us at the Rainy Veterans Day Parade this past fall. But our students are out doing blood drives. They do sports clinics, um, all kinds of community events. We have a dental clinic here, a free dental clinic on February 4th. Um, please spread the word about that. Uh, they deliver Meals on Wheels and they provide school district support so our students have a read in the classroom program where they're out in the community um, all the time. So if you ever have an event or something where you need an extra pair of hands, we have 46 baseball players and they just show up en masse and like set up tables and chairs and things like that and people people love them. We try to try to focus their energies toward nonprofits that really need some extra people power at certain times times. So I just shared a whole bunch of good news, but I thought it would be interesting to share with you too what we're struggling with here. Um, so the first thing is childcare. Um, a great many of our students are student parents, and um, we love that about them. We love that they're setting a good example for their kids and that they're investing in a brighter future for their families. And we are really focusing in some resources and how we can be a more family friendly campus so that those students feel like they're supported in being a parent as well as being a student. Um, and one of those ways is childcare. Uh, we used to have childcare that was uh, run by the college here on campus. We no longer have that. We now, now have the Montessori School, which offers some drop in childcare to our students. Um, but we're really thinking about ways that we can find partners in the community to offer um, to offer child care for our employees and also for our students. It's a tough one. Um, child care in general is an issue in communities right now everywhere. Um, but this is even tougher because we'd like some weekend care. We'd like some evening care. We'd like the kind of care where you can go to class for two hours and drop your child off. Um, and it's hard to find people who want to offer that service. And um, it's hard to figure out a business model that we can afford within our budget. So that's something we're wrestling with. We have uh, we have some groups on campus really looking into this issue and how we might move the needle on it. The second thing that we're struggling with is modernization. Um, UCC hasn't kept up with um, what we need digitally to make sure that we have a digital front door that our customers expect. Um, we all are so reliant on our phones, being able to do everything on our phones, um, being able to get online and do all of the processes we need just to run our lives. UCC is a little bit behind. We've, we've uh, not upgraded in the way that we probably should. So we started some investments in that this year. We're spending about a half a million dollars upgrading our website, upgrading all of our student support backend features. Um, my best example is, uh, is things like if you want to drop a class as a student, you actually have to come onto campus and sign a form. And if you're somebody with a job and two kids, that is really, really hard, right? Um, and we've got a few ways that are kind of clunky. You can do it dig digitally, but we should be better than that. Um, when I moved to Douglas County, I bought a house online. I never saw it. I never came anywhere. I never went anywhere to sign any papers. If we can do that, I'm pretty sure that the college can do a better job of serving our students digitally. So we are working on that, but it is, um, it's challenging. It's challenging in an era when it's hard to find IT employees uh, to staff our departments. And um, when our funding is tight, uh, these, are, these are not small purchases. And then back to that messaging issue that I already talked about because you uh, asked such a good question, Sherry. Um, we're struggling with messaging. The, 
the national narrative about higher education is not positive right now. Um, I think it's still a little bit more positive for community colleges than for four years because uh, you can come here and walk out with very, very little debt. Um, I, I do try to turn that phrase around a lot for our students that, you know, when you when you come and, and get an education, you're actually investing in yourself. You're not taking on debt. You are making an investment. Um, and it is the one investment you make in your entire life that nobody can ever, ever take from you. You might lose your car. You might lose your house. You may, you know, put your money in stocks that doesn't work out. Nobody can take your degree or certificate from you. That is the very best investment you can make. But turning that messaging around is a constant struggle for us um, in the current uh, political and national conversation, let's say. And then um, I have a couple slides to finish here. Uh, this this one is about eliminating generational poverty. So, um, you know, when, I, when I'm out and about and... Uh, I might be uh, getting a haircut or in the dentist chair and somebody says to me, so what do you do? And I say, I work at UCC. Oh, that's great. What do you do there? And I say, well, I'm the president. And they sort of look at me like, what does that mean? What does she do? I don't get it. Because, um, you know, well, how do you explain your job? And um, having been here over a year now and really understanding our community and meeting families, just like the one you see here, multiple generations who uh have interacted with the college, um, my job is really eliminating generational poverty. That is what we do here at UCC every single day. That is work, what we work toward, um, transforming lives um, and really working on eliminating generational poverty. It's, uh, it's a goal that we will never completely meet, I am guessing, um, but it, it has become a rallying cry around here um, and it gives me something to say to people when I'm in the dentist chair and they ask me what I do for a living. I, I, have, then, a question, I have a question yeah. about that for you, yes. Rachel. What kind of feedback or um, response do you get from the community in general around that ideology of generational poverty in this county? What do you um, hear from, I, I, I'm glad you're doing it. First, let me just say I'm supportive. Um, but I'm just wondering, what do you hear? Um, I hear overwhelmingly, uh, yes, that's our biggest problem. And yes, education is a strong pathway out um, of generational poverty for, for many of the folks who live here. But I would ask all of you, because you're hearing me say it. So so how how does that sit with you? Does that seem like what we should be doing here? I, I just wondered what you thought the community awareness was. I, I think I think most of us probably in the league would be in agreement with you. Um, I'm just wondering what other voices you hear out there um, with respect to industry, other organizations, uh, local leaders. Um, industry is uh, completely supportive and looking for a workforce that's well-trained and so their response is always, yeah, it seems like we've got a lot of folks here who could use a great job. If you can get them trained, we want to give them a great job and we want to help you eliminate generational poverty. Um, I would say, you know, our, our community leaders, the same. I don't, I don't hear anything negative about this. I would say that um, the hard part is getting to the people who actually are in that situation. Um, and and making sure that they understand that we're here for them and that UCC is for them. Um, when I get when I when I talk to students here who are um, uh, coming from backgrounds that have made it really challenging for them to be uh, successful in education, I universally hear from them that they never thought that college was for them. They never thought it was an option for them. They never thought they, they could be successful in college. They never got that messaging from their families. Um, they didn't realize that you could be like them and come here. 
Um, they, they saw themselves outside of the structure of what we do, if that makes sense. I think we have to educate the adults too, because I have friends who are teachers who say that there are parents who do not trust educators. They, they, they're suspicious of education. And, uh, I don't, I just don't know how their child has the opportunity to succeed when the parent doesn't trust the education. It's a great point, Sherry. I, I think I would add to what Sherry's talking about as far as the um, attitudes in the community about people in poverty. And um, there's, there's a lot of, at least what my experience is, and that is that there's a lot of blaming um, that people don't want to work, that they aren't working, that they're not doing their part, that they're, and I think that message is old. I think it's an old message that goes back. And when we talk about generational, I think that it's very relative, you know, um, but looking at the core of our community too, and our history and, and the, the demographics. So I'm glad you're you're working on that. I'm just I'm just very curious about how the rest of the community is going to help you and support you and address it. Mm -hmm. So that that was the point of my question. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna leave you with a quote. Um, so I have moments of real terror when I think we might be losing this generation. We have got to bring these young people into the active life of the community and make them feel that they are necessary. Um, I hear a lot of people saying things like that right now. But the interesting thing about this quote is that it came from 1934, <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt. So uh, if you're feeling despairing about our, our younger generation or, um, you know, what's going to happen in the future, how are these kids going to make it, they'll be okay. They're actually awesome. I'm with them every day. We have amazing young people and, uh, you know, people of all ages coming to UCC and um, investing in their future and being excited to be vibrant members of our community. So um, these kids in 1934 who turned into our greatest generation, um, Eleanor Roosevelt was really worried about them and they seem to turn out okay. So I'm feeling very positive about what we've got ahead. And that is my final slide. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. It's inspiring and to know that uh, you're here and working in our community to uh, enable people to lead the lives that they, they need and want to lead. So thank you so very much. And um, I look forward to posting this recording on YouTube so others can also enjoy it. So I'll send out a an email about it since uh, many people weren't able to make it tonight. Great, and uh, Stacy said she wants my presentation and I will certainly, uh, I'll probably just make a PDF and email it to Robin and then she can distribute okay. it, that's okay. Great. Awesome, that's wonderful. Thank you so much and thanks to the audience for being here. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate it. Yes, awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to Thank see you. Thank you everyone. Good night now. Good night.